Good afternoon. I will be using the clock at the back of the wall. So it says it's 12.45, so we're going to get started. Thank you. There's your first tip of the day. Maybe the best one I have for you is if you're going to try to scream over a classroom of students, you will lose. Okay? So have a procedure to get their attention, and it can be very simple, like I'm ready to start, and just stop for a second. And as people start to look at you, then look back and smile at the ones who have stopped talking, okay? Who will then start encouraging other people, and you don't have to do the screaming, all right? From there, then let's get started, because we have a couple hours today that we're going to spend talking about some things that I hope are become valuable to you, things that you can take right back to the classroom and work with as soon as you go back. The first thing I want to do is those things that we just need to get out of the way, make sure you have everything you need and you know how the day's going to run and all those things bring down your anxiety. It also gives me a chance to bring down, bring down my anxiety because there's a guy back there filming, okay, and I'm not used to that, okay. So the first thing we're going to do is make sure at the table you have everything you need. Inside your packet it's goldenrod. You'll want to find the goldenrod. There is a classroom management summary. There's an effective discipline. And then there's the handout that goes with the PowerPoint. Okay? When you find those, I want you to take the classroom management summary and the effective discipline, put them on top of the handout for the PowerPoint, turn them upside down in front of you, and ignore them for a while. Okay, because we're not going to need them right away, all right? But that way you have them out and we don't have to stop during the middle now and find them, okay? Second thing, at your table, and I'm going to borrow yours, okay? At your table, you should have three things. You need a consensus map. You need a set of index cards. And you need some sticky tabs, okay? As we go through, if you find you don't have enough of something that I set out at the table, just let me know. I have some more up here, and we can get you what you need, and we'll get started, okay? First things first, I guess introductions would be a good idea. Since you have to put up with me for the next two hours, you will want to know who to call Sherry about and say, why in the world do you have him coming? Okay, so I want you to make sure you get my name right if you're going to complain, okay? My name is Greg Coleman. Um, Special Ed Coordinator slash Principal slash whatever else they want to say I have to do is my title. Um, let me give you a little background just so that you understand where I'm coming from and then uh, we'll get started. My whole teaching career and my whole educational career has been spent in USD 259. So I do feel that to be able to stand in front of you, I have some background knowledge of where the district's been, where the district is, and hopefully where we're headed. So that, I think, gives me the right to be able to stand up here today and talk to you because my whole career has been with this district, so this is what I know. All right? Elementary folks, raise your hand. See, they're never shy. They'll put it right up. They don't mind. Put it right up. Secondary folks, raise your hand. Great. All right. Here's the good news. I can talk about both. My teaching experience is elementary. My new job that I took five years ago required me to learn secondary. Okay? So background came straight out of Emporia State. I know purple is not Emporia State, but I was looking for at least one clap. Where's my Emporia State people? <laughs> Man, all right, we'll try again later. Maybe I can find something. I came from Emporia State, graduated in the middle of the year because football was my first priority. So I had to take a few uh, extra months to graduate when I realized football wasn't going to last forever. Um, I am slow, though, so it took a year or so to figure that out. Okay. Graduated December, started a long-term assignment at Cloud Elementary in January. Had never been to Cloud Elementary. So again, I have some experience as to what you're dealing with as well. 
because I started as a long-term sub, walked in on a Tuesday because Monday was a holiday, never been in the building, knew none of the students, none of the building, none of the class, did not know the principal or anything, started teaching. Somehow they kept me after that. Okay, that's the good news, or at least for me it was the good news, is they decided to offer me the job the following year. Spent three years at Cloud teaching what we call now ID students, intellectually disabled, or back then MR students, mentally retarded, self-contained classroom, kindergarten, first and second graders, who, by the way, do show behaviors. So just in case you were worried, I'm going to talk about behaviors, but I dealt with kindergartners and don't know any. I know quite a few. Okay? And seniors' behaviors are not that much different than kindergarten behaviors. Okay? <laughs> so we can take care of that right away. After that, we had some changes going on in the district. Uh, it was one of those periods of time where we were looking at closing schools. McLean's Elementary School was a small school, neighborhood school, wanted to stay open. They couldn't stay open. They didn't have enough kids. So the idea was we'll take this group who's at Cloud, because Cloud had too many kids. We'll take them out of there, put them at McLean. McLean can stay open. So myself and two other teachers, ID teachers, took 50, 60 kids over to McLean, started a program there, and spent the next, I don't know, 20-some years there. Okay? And yes, I used to be able to say the number, but I don't know what's changed. But now it's hard for me to say numbers. I just round them off. So spent the next about 20 years teaching, first of all, self-contained ID students, K through 3, moving into about the last 15 years teaching interrelated, which basically means any type of student with a disability other than gifted. Became the only teacher, special ed teacher at McLean uh, for about the last 12 years. So I've taught K through 5 interrelated uh, for 12 years. Then after 20 some years of doing that, decided to go back get a degree. Got another degree, got into administration, thought it'd be a good idea. Hey, I could become an assistant principal at an elementary school. That would make sense. I still get to be with kids. Don't have to leave all of that. And I uh, feel like maybe I could expand upon what I knew to other people. Well, I put my name on the list, realized, you know, this uh, job searching thing is not as easy as it looks, um, especially when they interview you and there's like five or six people that you know are way up there, okay? and hadn't done any interviews for 20 some years because I had a nice job, liked the job I had. So I wasn't sure I was doing very well. So the special ed department also had an opening called a special ed coordinator. I applied for it because I didn't know all the people that were interviewing. I thought that'd be good. I actually know these people. They've either been teaching with me or they were my coordinator. So I felt much more comfortable and realistically understood the fact that after I was done, I could say, okay, how do I get a job? Because I realize I'm not doing this right. Okay? So went and applied, did the interview. The next day, the director of special ed called and said, we know your name is on a couple lists in the district to look at, so we're going to offer you the job first. Well, that was great, except I wasn't looking for that job. <laughs> so I told him I had to think about it, and as the district goes, he gave me about 10 hours to think about it. I think I was lucky to get the 10. So thought about it, decided I'd done all my teaching career with special ed, maybe that's where I needed to be. So I, six years ago, well, this started my sixth year, I took the job as special ed coordinator. Here was the good news, it was elementary. I thought, cool, I've done elementary all my life, I can do that. So we start up in July as coordinators, I didn't realize that when I took the job, that your summer gets cut in half. So in July, I walked into my office, which is not an office, by the way. They call it an office. It has no walls, has no windows, has no doors. It's called a cube, not, a, not an office. Okay? In my office was a desk turned upside down and a piece of paper on it, which had all my school assignments on it. So I look at the piece of paper, and North High is at the top. So I didn't realize, but I went around and asked, why are we changing North High to an elementary school? And isn't it going to be awful big? And I was told, yes and no. It won't be changing, but yes, you're going there. I thought, great, I can do that. Go to the high school. I've never been in a high school in the Wichita area. I don't know anything about the high schools, but how different can it be? Well, it's extremely different okay, in some regards. But in some regards, it's not extremely different. So for you secondary folks, yes, my background is elementary, but I did have North High for one year, learned a lot of things about 
uh, students with disabilities, behaviors, classroom management at the secondary level. And for the last five years, not only have I had North High, but for the last five years, I've also had three middle schools. So I do have some secondary background now. I've talked to a lot of folks in the secondary area. And as of recently, uh, last year, became the principal of our school inside the children's home here in Wichita, which is all high school. So I went back to leaving North High and getting all my elementaries and a few middle schools to coming back to high school again. And this year, recently adding on top of the children's home, I'm also the principal now at one of our buildings inside a lockdown facility. So, and again, we have their elementary, middle, and high school. Okay? So I do have some background I think I can share with you. I think most of the things we're going to talk about are generic enough to go elementary, middle, or high, but I will try to use examples in all three of those areas so that you don't feel like, why was I sitting here? What does he know about it? I do know some things about it, and we're going to try to share those with you and see if we can uh, go from there. Here's how I want to start then. Since you know my background now, uh, we're going to take a look at these three things. We're going to take a look at behavior, classroom management, and discipline. And the reason I put all three of them up there is because I couldn't figure out how to talk about one without talking about the others. Okay? Because they're all intertwined. Okay? I almost made it one word, but it, it wouldn't let me on the computer. It kept underlining it, saying that's not a word. But I thought, really, it is. Okay? Because if you're going to talk about behavior, you're going to have to talk about classroom management. If you're going to talk about classroom management, what does everybody want to know? How do I discipline people? Okay? So all those are going to be together. Here's the good news. Not only are we going to talk about students, we're going to talk about adults. What are we going to talk about when we talk about adults? We're going to talk about behavior. We're going to talk about classroom management. We're going to talk about discipline. Okay? So the good news is you're going to hear some things about students. You're also going to hear things about adults. Okay? So from there, here's what I need you to do first. Because after two hours, even I am tired of hearing myself. And yes, I did say that on tape, and my wife will be able to use that later because she won't <laughs> believe it because she thinks I can talk just to enjoy myself. But really, I will get tired of it, so I'm going to let you do some things. Here's what I need you to do first. You know those note cards that are on your table? If somebody would grab that stack and make sure everybody gets one note card, please. And since behavior was the first thing I put on the slide, that's the first one we're going to talk about. Not necessarily that that's the most important. It just happened to be the first thing I put up on the slide. So let's take a look at behavior. Here's what we have so far. We have a question. What is behavior? OK? Here's what I'm going to do for you. Another little tip for teaching. Give students choices. OK? And if you get really good at giving choices, guess what? Most of the choices you give are the same. Okay? You just word it differently. Okay? All right? So here's what I'm going to do because I want to model good teaching for you. I'm going to give you a choice. The question is, what is behavior? Here's your choice. You may write the definition of behavior on your note card or simply answer the question. Either way, you can answer the question, what is behavior, or simply give me a definition. All right? Not going to give you a lot of time because truly the two hours are going to go quickly, I hope. I know they do for me. I hope they do for you. So we've got to stay on track. So go ahead and think about the question, what is behavior? Go ahead and start thinking about an answer or a definition. No, it does not have to be in complete sentences. It can be bulleted. It can be misspelled. No one here is going to check all that. Okay? All we want to know is, are you thinking about the word behavior? And it tells me where you're coming from so that I know how to adjust my presentation. So just a couple minutes independently. I might not have mentioned that earlier. Make sure I get it in now. Independently, you need to be putting down either a, be a definition of the word behavior or answering the question, what is behavior? Just give you about another 30 seconds to wrap that up. Where's my secondary English people? Where are you at? Go ahead, raise your hand. Uh -huh. No, you can't have another card. You have to fill in just the one. Make it simple.
All righty, while you're finishing up, we'll go ahead and get started on the next activity. We'll let you know where we're going from there. Here's what I want to do. I just want you to take that card, okay, and you're going to share it with your table, and we're going to do what's called a round robin share, okay, which simply means we're going to pick somebody. They're going to go first. Everybody else is going to listen to what you have to say, okay? And when you do it in the round robin style, the listeners do one thing, listen. We're not going to talk about it. We're not going to discuss it. You're not going to say, what in the world were you thinking? Okay? We're not going to say that. We're just going to listen. Okay? So what we're going to do next right now is you're going to pick somebody, and it doesn't matter who you pick. That person's going to go first. They're going to say what they wrote down, or they're going to make it up if they didn't write it down. And see, that's okay, too. See, the objective wasn't to make you write. The objective was to get you to think. So if you thought about it but didn't write it down, guess what? Pull it out of your head and say what you look like you wrote down. Okay? And then go all the way around the table, and when the last person's done, we'll go to the next activity, all right? You may get started. All righty, it looks like we've got that wrapped up. If you're not quite finished, go ahead and finish. You're not going to bother me. I'm just going to give you the next activity. Here's what we're going to do. As a table, you heard some great definitions, I'm sure, or some great answers to the question, what is, be, what is behavior? Here's what I want you to do. Now you're going to take your consensus map. And as a table, you must come up with one definition or answer to the question. And you must all agree upon what is being written down on that mat. That is a table mat meaning everybody has input into it, and everybody must come to consensus that that's what we want to report out. All right, give you just a couple minutes. Go ahead and get started. All righty, here's the next thing I need you to do. What I would like, please, is for somebody at your table. Boy, that's how you get people's attention, start talking about what I need. What I'd like is a volunteer. Here's what you're going to volunteer to do. You're going to volunteer to pick up that consensus mat, and you're going to volunteer to stand up. Okay? So very quickly, let's have a volunteer grab that mat and stand up very quickly. Here we go. Good. Look, we've got four or five. Look how quick it's going. There it is. Good. Okay, here we go. All right, good. Last one. Got it. All right, here we go. Another quick little tip. Volunteers, thank you for volunteering. Here's what you get to do. As the volunteer, you get to either stay standing and read that to us, or you may pass it to somebody else at your table. <laughs> so real quick, give you a second to think about it, OK? Why do I do that? Because again, it allows kids choices and it rewards people for taking a chance, OK? So if you're willing to take the chance, I'm going to reward you by letting you decide if it's OK for you to go ahead and read it or if you'd like somebody else to read it, all right? We're going to try it without the microphone, so speak loudly, please. But if we need the microphone, I'll bring it around to you. But let's try first without. We're just going to start right over there. If you'll just tell us what it says, please, yes. Behavior is the actions displayed in response to external stimuli, environment, or the internal thoughts and emotions. Behavior is the actions of individuals, whether it be negative or positive. How one presents themselves in any given situation. A personal response, negative or positive, verbally or non-verbally, to interactions with our environment and others. Behavior is how a person acts or reacts positively or negatively to his or her environment based on uh, personal experience. Right. Behavior is the condition or manner in which one acts or carries oneself or another species of Behavior is a reaction to the environment. The way the One's attitude, whether positive or negative, toward others, their reaction and interaction with surroundings and emotions. We 
here are very cut and dry. It's actions and reactions. All righty. First thing, sorry. First thing, give yourself a little round of applause. Very nice. All right. Secondly, let me tell you a little something about that and why I do that. First of all, I just don't like to talk the whole time, but that's not the only reason. The other reason I do is, one, it does give me a background from where you're thinking about behavior, okay? And then the other thing is, after five years of doing this presentation, it also tells me where we've been and where we're going, okay? Because now maybe more than five years ago before I was presenting, because there were other people that did this before I started this, and they would, and I told them what I was doing and we talked about it, and they were telling me, well, we, when you ask this question, here's what you're gonna get. You're going to get from the secondary folks, sorry, I gotta pick on you now, I'm gonna pick on elementary at times too, but from the secondary folks, when you ask them about behavior, here's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get behavior is, Everything the student got up this morning wrote down on a piece of paper to ruin my day. <laughs> okay? Well, here's where I'll argue with you. Three-fourths of our secondary students don't want to write, so they didn't make a list. Okay? And if they did, I would be telling teachers, have them hand it in and grade it. Okay? Maybe the only thing you get in writing. All right? So the good news is you'd have something. All right? The second thing is, trust me, and easier to say to all of you than to say to my teachers who are in the buildings every day, okay, they're, you are not the center of their universe, okay? When they got up this morning, they weren't thinking about you, okay? I hate to tell you that, and you probably believe that, but you try to tell some kindergarten teachers that, okay? They don't buy that at all. They're, everybody's world evolves around them, okay? so. The good news is that's not what we heard. And the good news is that's not where we're going, and it's certainly not where we want to be later, okay? So I think you're on the same page as, as I am on and as the district's on, and that's great, okay? Because truly, here's the district's definition of what behavior is. Behavior, according to what we talk about in this district, is simply this. It's simply that right there, okay? Anybody know her? Okay. Anybody seen her? Okay. Because I have one at home. Looks just like that. Okay. All right. And then here's our definition. It is simply the expression of the dynamic relationship between the individual and the environment. Let's talk about adults first. Okay. Some of you are very observant. Some of you have already noticed and commented, by the way, on behaviors that you've already seen. By who? Your presenter, me, I have behaviors, absolutely, okay? I have behaviors. One of those behaviors is I will not stand still, okay? I can't. doesn't work for me, all right? I'm not sure it's working back there in the back for the cameraman, but it doesn't work for me to stand behind a pulpit, all right? That's a behavior, okay? Here's where we get in trouble with behaviors. The way we get in trouble when we start talking about behaviors is when we as adults start putting things like good, bad, positive, negative attached. Why does that get us in trouble? Because for my behavior to walk around may seem to you as a negative behavior. I wish he would stand still so I could follow him. But for me, it's a positive behavior because it's the only way I can do this. Because if I had to stand behind the pulpit and just preach it to you, I would tell them, no, not happening. Okay? And we'll talk about that down the road here. But it simply it really is the expression of the relationship between the individual and the environment. Happens all the time. Another example for adults. Anybody ever driven on Kellogg? Okay, God bless you all. Okay? Here's the deal, behaviors, environment. When there's not a police officer around, how fast is, are the people on Kellogg going? Okay, there you go. What happens when we change the environment and we don't even put a police officer there, we put a police car on the side with a dummy in it. And I don't mean a, the police officer, I mean an actual dummy, okay? What happens? 
Some people slow down. I, I'm very cautious about saying everyone because some people react differently to that environment or the same. They still may be doing 90 because that's their expression of the relationship between them. Now, what happens if we not only put a police officer out there, but we give him a radar gun and he starts stopping people? Okay, we got more people slowing down. What about the person who just got the $200 ticket? Is that behavior going to change? Yes, for how long? Aha, uh -huh. so see, there's our other problem when, it, when we look at student behavior. As adults, we want to say, and we'll get into this with the discipline, but we'll, we'll talk about it just for a second. We want to say, what can I do to make your life so miserable that you will stop that behavior? And what's the problem with that? First of all, you can't make them do anything. And second of all, even if we write you a $200 ticket, how long does it last? Not very long for some people. Probably right after he turns and goes the other way. Now, for other people, maybe a day, maybe a month, maybe a year, you know. So that you have the same thing there. So it's simply an expression of the dynamic relationship between individuals' environments, okay? So we're, the good news is we're not going to tie the good and bad to it, all right? Because the other thing is that's your perception. That may not be the person's perception who has the behavior. And when you start using your perception, sometimes we are not accurate, okay? When you talk about behaviors, too, the other thing that, oh, and there's my other behavior, okay? Is that a good or bad behavior? Depends on what world you live in. If this is at my house and that's all that's happening, that's a pretty good behavior, okay? If it's in my classroom when I was teaching, that's a great behavior because I taught my students to express themselves verbally. Why? Because if I didn't teach them how to do it verbally, they did it non-verbally and shoes start flying at me, okay? I would take this over shoes flying at me any day, right? Okay? So that's why we have to be careful with positive, negative, good, and bad. So with that, let's also talk about this. Precipitating factors. Precipitating factors are internal or external, and I heard that on some of those placemats. Causes of an acting out behavior, and here's the bad news, Precipitating factors you have little or no control over as a staff member, okay? And they often serve as the antecedent. In other words, the trigger. They're what causes the behavior. Or they're the, they set that event so that it becomes a crisis situation. So why in the world would I want to put up a slide and spend the next five to ten minutes talking about something that you have little or no control over? What? So you can learn how to deal with it a little bit. There's one reason. Oh, come on now. I heard this was the active group. I mean, she said it like twice to me when I pulled it up here. She's like, oh, you're going to love this group. They just talk, talk, talk. They're active. <laughs> Empathy. Lunch. That's the problem. Yes, yeah, see, that's a behavior. That's what happens, see. All right. There you go, okay? All of those are excellent ideas of why I want to talk about this, okay? The other thing is it goes back to those kindergarten teachers. Again, as adults, sometimes what we see a behavior existing for may not be for that reason. So in other words, I'll give you a great kindergarten example. I had a young lady in my kindergarten room. Most of the time, very sweet young lady, okay? But I noticed the first couple of weeks, it was like the third week of school. It was a Friday. I can remember that even today. It was a Friday, and she came in, and, and she knew the routine, and she knew what we were supposed to do. And we always started with calendar. So they would put their stuff up. They'd come sit down at the carpet square. They knew which carpet square was theirs. We'd start with calendar, and that wasn't happening. And, of course, being the great teacher I was, because it was like my second year, you know, so I was perfect, you know. I'm going, okay, we got a problem. Why, you know? She doesn't want to do calendar. I'm asking her to do calendar. Why don't you want to do calendar? I'm talking all these things about you're going to do calendar. You can either do calendar or you're going to have this punishment. I'm thinking of the biggest punishments I can think of. You know, and we're going through this whole thing, and we're going through this whole thing, and calendar never happens for her, okay? 
and then somebody around me decides to be smart and listen to her, and guess why she's not doing calendar? Unbelievably had nothing to do with me. Can you imagine that? Because I couldn't. I mean, she's in my room. It's my, notice, my room. She didn't get that part, my room, okay? Had nothing to do with me. Here's what it had to do with. She has a favorite shirt. She wears that shirt a lot. Even I noticed that. Okay, that means you wear it a lot if I notice, right, ladies? Okay, so I had noticed that. Guess what? She didn't have that shirt on. Why not? Because mom says I have to wash it. Otherwise, the school will report me because they're going to think that's all I let you wear and that's all we have and I'm not keeping you clean. So mom says, you know, I didn't get it done last night. You're not wearing it. Nothing to do with me, nothing to do with calendar, simply because she's not wearing her favorite shirt. But who gets to hear about it? Me. Why? Yeah, because it's the great thing about being a parent. You drop them off and leave. If mom would have been there, what would the conversation have looked like? Same thing, but mom's not there. She dropped her off. Guess who gets to hear about it? Me. Absolutely. What's the problem with that if I don't listen? I can put all kinds of strategies, interventions in place, and guess what? None of them are going to work. Why not? Because it didn't have anything to do with what she needed. Absolutely. Okay? So precipitating factors. That's one of the reasons we want to talk about them. Yes, you have little or no control. I could not decide if she's wearing that shirt or not, right? Okay? That I was out of my hand. But did it tell me what might be going on? If I listened, it would have. Absolutely. Okay? And if you think about precipitating factors, we're going to look at it in this regard. We're going to look at it as an iceberg. Okay? And not because I'm an expert in icebergs. I'm not. I just saw Titanic once or twice. Okay? And what I did learn about icebergs is they're really big. Right? But how much do you see? Not very much. Okay? Think of that iceberg. At the top, what you see is what? Behaviors. All that you don't see is what? Precipitating factors. Okay? So it looks like this. There's our iceberg. The things that we see is that little bitty piece at the top. So if we don't talk about precip precipitating factors, then we miss out on all that stuff underneath. Okay? So it's all these things down here. All right? So what kind of things do you think students USD 259 are bringing with them? Child abuse, sexual abuse. sexual abuse, hunger, divorce, divorce. Un unemployment, homeless, homeless. Poverty. poverty. Pop it out again, it's okay, I missed it. Domestic violence, violence. missing father, missing father. Bullying. bullying, tired, deaf in the family, I have a disability. Just little things like mom took away PlayStation last night. Seem, seems little to us. Try to tell that to a 12-year-old boy, that that's a little thing, especially if he's online playing that game and he's the only one of the five of his group that didn't get a play. That becomes a huge deal. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Got medical issues. Yeah. How many of those things can you control as a teacher? None of them. How many of them do you need to know about as a teacher? All of them. Why? Because it's not always about us. Okay? Now, does that mean that Greg is standing up here for the next two hours telling you it's okay, the students do whatever they want because they're bringing precipitating factors to class? No, it's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, though, we have to understand that they're there. Okay? We have to understand that they're there, especially if you think about the two places I'm a principal, principal at the children's home. Okay? There's a reason students are at the children's home. Okay? Math may not be the top of their priority that morning. Okay? I'm a principal at a facility where the students are locked down. In other words, they live there 24-7, can't leave, don't have a choice. Okay? Apex for our high school kids may not be the top of your priority list if you're in a facility like that, okay? 
My elementary students, everyday math may not be the top of their things that they were thinking about when they walk into class, okay? At the facility that I'm the principal at, not even all of our students come from Wichita. Unlike the children's home, mostly come from Sedgwick County. The lockdown facility called Riverside, we have students from Washington, D.C., okay? By the way, students from Washington, D.C., high school boys, don't find Kansas to be all that great. I know that. Didn't take me long to figure that out either, because I did learn to listen right away, like the second day. We're from Washington, and we don't like Kansas. Well, you know, I'm from Kansas, and some days I don't like Kansas, so we're going to get along just fine, okay? All right? So those precipitating factors, remember the top is the outward behavior, and the bottom is all that stuff that they bring, okay? So then let's talk about behaviors, okay? Because that's what we've been talking about. Let's continue. What else do we need to know about behaviors? Well, I think one of the things you also need to know, and especially as a substitute, certainly as a regular ed teacher or a special ed teacher, but a teacher that's there every day, but I think you all need to know it too, okay? So we're going to spend a few minutes here. So here's what I want to do first. On your table, there were some sticky pads, right? All right. I want you to take two or three apiece. Doesn't matter to me if it's two or three. And for some of you, you know, if you need five, go ahead, grab five. I understand that too. Okay. There's that choice thing again. All right. What I want you to do is I want you to think about behaviors. Because I will tell you that for, remember, about 25 years, it was me sitting where you are listening to people from the district, okay? And one of the things I didn't like when I was in your spot sitting at the table having to listen to people is they had this agenda in their head, and that's what they talked about, and it may or may not have had anything to do with what I wanted to hear. So I want to make sure that we're talking about behaviors that you want to talk about. So here's what I want you to do. On each of those sticky notes, I want you to simply write one behavior that either you have seen, heard, and it can be from a student, it can be from another adult, it can be from your significant other, okay, because, you know, my wife's not here, we can talk about her, okay? My daughter's not here, we'll talk about her later too, okay? So we'll, we'll do those things. So when you're thinking about it, I just simply want you to think of that iceberg again, and I want you to write down those outward behaviors, the things that you actually see or hear. Okay? Don't worry about the things they're bringing, but what do you see and hear okay? as behaviors of students or other adults, um, administrators? I mean, we can talk about lots of people. They're not here. Okay? Your significant other, teacher down this hallway. But I want each behavior on a separate sticky note. Okay, one behavior for each note, and you need at least two or three because you'll want to be able to participate in the activity, all right? Give you just a couple of seconds to finish up. Go ahead and make your stack. Go ahead and put it to the side. And you can either put them all together in the middle of the table or keep yours separate for right now. It doesn't matter. But we're just, we're going to come back to them. Don't think that I forgot. Or if I do forget, you'll remind me. All right, here's what we're going to do then. We talked about behaviors. We've been starting to talk about behaviors. We're talking about precipitating factors. And now I've asked you to write down some behaviors. Here's the next step that we want to talk about. Because anytime you talk about behaviors, all behavior specialists will tell you this. Behaviors exist for a reason. Okay? All behaviors, be it students, be it adults, all behaviors that interaction between myself and my environment exists for a reason. Okay? Quick example. I'm standing up here talking to you. That's a behavior. Why do I do that? I get paid. There's a reason. I love this, or you. There's a reason. Sherry said I had to. There's a reason. Okay? So all behaviors exist for a reason. Now, here's the great thing about behaviors. Get on the internet, type in behaviors. 
just let your computer set for two days because it's going to pull up millions and millions of things about behavior. Okay? So don't do that. Okay? But when the district decided what we were going to do is we were going to look at trying to make a list of why we think behaviors exist. And we have narrowed that down to about five. Now, if you get on the internet and you look around at behavior specialists, there's anywhere from about three to about 15 reasons. We basically use about five here in the district, okay? Here's what they look like. Number one, the reason for the behavior is to gain attention, okay? And hopefully what you'll find out from me this afternoon is I'm not just going to spill things out at you. I want to really make it hit home. So I'm not just going to say gain attention. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how it looks, how it feels, what's it sound like, so that you really understand what I'm talking about. So let's uh, think of a behavior real quick. Somebody's got a behavior in their head that somebody might be using to gain of attention. What's the behavior? All right, raising your hand. Thank you, Ann. Throwing things, look at that, great. See, we've got what some people might consider a negative behavior, and some people would consider a positive behavior. Raising your hand, throwing things. Do they both get attention? Absolutely, okay? As teachers, which one would we rather have? Raise your hand, all right. But do they exist for a reason? Did she raise her hand for a reason? Yes, why? She wanted to answer my question. She wanted my attention, okay? If you would have thrown something at me, would you have been using that behavior for a reason? Yes, what would be the reason? To get my attention. Do students use behaviors to get attention? Yes, absolutely. Middle school, there you go, very much, see everybody's with me. Middle school, very much so. Okay, what kind of behaviors do we use at the middle school to get attention? Oh, words that are inappropriate. Does that get people's attention? Absolutely, yeah, all right. The way they dress, sure. Are you trying to get attention by the way you dress? You might be, absolutely, okay. So gaining attention at the middle school, it might be the words I use, the way I dress, the people I hang around, okay? Walking in the class late, could I be trying to get somebody's attention? Yeah. And when we talk about gaining attention, whose attention are we talking about? Depends on the behavior. Yeah, it can be the teacher, okay? We wanna get the teacher's attention because I'm raising my hand. Probably most of the students don't care, but the teacher might actually give you attention for raising your hand. Now, your neighbor might also give you attention, and he's going to say, well, I'm a little Miss Brownie nose over there raises her hand. So, you know, you might get a few students' attention, but teachers for sure. Who else? The class, other students, absolutely. Anybody else? Parents, sure. You want to get parents' attention, what do you do? You, what's that? Sure, throw a shoe. Why? Because you get sent to the office, and what does the office do? Call mom and dad. Whose attention do I have? Mom and dad's, maybe. Absolutely. And do some students care what kind of attention they get? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, because attention, any kind, is better than none. Perfect example. See, I told you I was going to talk about my daughter. She's not here. 16-year-old girl. Okay? There are times she does not care how she gets my attention. She just wants it. Okay? She has learned she can get it in a couple of ways. Because I'm perfect, so I don't let her know that, you know, um, as a parent, that I've got this figured out. But uh, certainly she can get my attention. And one of the ways she gets my attention is making sure she has the last word, which means I can't ever leave. Because what do I know as a dad? I have to have the last word. OK? So a three-second conversation becomes three hours because she wants my attention. And even if it turns into 
you can't do this, and you're never going here, and you were never leaving the bedroom until you're 40, and da 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 and all those things. She doesn't care. One, because she's figured out at 16 that I can't make half of those happen. Okay? And two, she just wanted me. Okay? And getting a negative attention is better than none. Okay? All right? So getting attention is one. Second one, avoid and escape. Wow, there's a behavior for you. What does that look like, feel like, sound like? Going to the restroom. Sharpen a pen, oh, man. I'll tell you what, the person who figured out how to make a pencil sharpener had it figured out, didn't he? Put that in a school, watch pencils disappear quickly. I mean to tell you what, the guy who invented the pencil sharpener probably also has money in pencils, okay? All right, and somebody said, nurse. Oh, man, you must be elementary. Oh, God. There you go, there you go. What's the nurse there for at elementary? What's her job? To have a place for kids to avoid and escape everything they don't like. That's really what she's there for. Okay. What were Band-Aids made for? To send you back into what you were trying to avoid and escape. Band-Aid will fix anything, right? A Band-Aid or an ice pack. I mean, again, I wish 20 years ago when I started teaching, I wish I'd have figured that out because I'd have bought stock in both. Okay. Because we go through them like they are just water. All right. Nurses will give a Band-Aid for anything or an ice pack. It solves it all and gets you back to class. What's it really solve? The avoidance and the escape, okay? So nursing, sharpening pencils, restroom, tissues, drawing, sleeping, crawling under the desk, texting, water. I'm, I can't talk. I've got to have a drink. Absolutely. All right, so we think everybody's feeling comfortable with what that looks like, sounds like, okay? Number three, game power control. Coming to class late. Ooh, all right. What? Not turning in your work. Arguing, what? Students in USD 259 will argue? Boy, what school are you at? I got to check that out. I've not seen that. Not in any of my schools. We don't have that. Asking questions, especially questions that get the teacher off subject, like, I like your purple shirt, you must be a K-State fan, let's talk about football. Catch the right teacher, and what's the next 45 minutes look like? Football. football. What class is it? Doesn't matter. Okay. Elementary. Looks just like it. Secondary, looks just like it. Doesn't take long for kids to figure out. Power and control is all about power and control. If I want it, what do I have to do? Get it. How do I get it? Any way I can. Like coming into class late, bullying, refusing to do it, disrupting class, who has the power? I do, because I can disrupt your entire class. Okay, so we feel all right with that one? Power and control, all right. How about number four, self-stimulate? Yes, that's what part of it means. Okay, it also can be pacing back and forth. Hmm, kind of like your presenter. Why do I do that? I have a reason behind it. It's a self-stimulating reason, okay? What does it do for me? Brings down my anxiety, brings my nerves down, okay? Because then I only have to look at part of you thinking that's only about 15 people staring at me, not, oh, 70 people staring at me going, man, I hope he knows what he's talking about, okay? So what else could it look like, feel like, sound like? Thumb sucking, absolutely. Tapping that pencil. Yeah, there you go. Great one. Clicking pins. Sure, rocking. 
Absolutely. Hand flapping? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's what all, playing with your hair. Now, I used to be able to do that too, but it doesn't, now I have to pace. <laughs> Tipping back in your chair and demonstrating it. I like, see, there's behaviors all over. Absolutely. Telling jokes when you feel uncomfortable. It brings down that anxiety. Swinging your legs. Absolutely. Okay. Here's an example I'll give you. Sorry, it's secondary. It's an elementary example. But here's an example that I can give you. I was doing a presentation like this to school librarians. It's one of my first years of doing this new job. And by the way, they also didn't explain that I would be presenting. I thought I was simply going to go out to schools and talk about special ed issues. Oh, no. Then they also said, oh, those other things that we said on the bottom when we hired you, said anything else we wanted you to do, you have to do. This is one of those presentations. So I got the librarians together. And they said, Greg, you need to talk to them about behavior. So I did. So we got together. We talked about behaviors. And I found out a couple of things about librarians. Maybe you don't know this, because I didn't know it until I got them all together and started talking about it. First thing I learned is the books in the school library belong to the librarian. The librarian. She owns them all. Did you know that? I had no idea we were paying librarians that much money that they could buy every book in the library. But they own them all. What's the other thing that I learned? That they get no money. They don't have any money. They see every student in the building, and they have a very small budget. And they'll tell you that. Trust me, for three days, I heard it. Okay? And here's the problem with that. We were talking about behaviors. One of the behaviors that came up, and man, I mean it came up, came up in all three sessions, three different levels of librarians, three different days. First one that came up all three times was the behavior of students doing what? Chewing on pencils. Because here's the problem. They have a small budget. They see every student. What does that mean? It means I buy one set of pencils for the entire building for the entire year. Okay? So you know, and if you're in an elementary library, if you've ever been there, they have those cute little table pencil holders, whatever they want to call them. You know, they decorate something really cute, and the crayons and the pencils are in there. And the problem is, though, that every group has to use them, right? Okay, and in middle school, it's not quite as cute, but there's a table thing, probably more like what you have in front of you, little plastic tubs, got things in it that you might need. And at the high school, you, well, you know, by the time we get to high school, we're lucky if we even have pencils in the library for them, okay? Because who knows what they'd do with them, all right? But here is what I found out, that if a student chews on that pencil, that will just throw a librarian into a fit because they have to throw that pencil away. They have no budget. They can't afford to throw pencils away. So we talked about, well, why would they be chewing on pencils? Okay. Well, here's what I told them was my hypothesis. Now, I will tell you it didn't go over too well, but here's my hypothesis. In the real world, so I'm talking outside of education, as a parent, I had taken my kids, my own three, to the library. Okay before. We've gone multiple times. And what I found out is when you walk into a public library, what do you get to do? You get to be quiet, but what else do you get to do? Yeah, you get to look at books. Well, guess what happens in a school library when you walk in? Yeah, you're told to do what? Sit down. Sit down. There's not a book there. What do you mean I have to sit down? When I go to the public library every day, I've gone with my parents, I was able to walk up, pick the book I want, and start reading. I go to a library, still a library, at school, and what's the first thing the librarian says? Sit down. Why? Because she has a lesson to teach. Okay? She's got something she's got to do. Okay, here's the problem, though. What do I want? I want books. Behavior exists for a reason. So why do I chew on the pencil? Could be that I'm bored with the lesson. Irritation. What? Frustration of not getting the book. I mean, come on, my favorite book. I saw it yesterday. It's right there, like three feet away. Okay, right there, dinosaurs all over this book. 
Colored pages, no, I can't read it, but man, having dad try to read it is great because he can't read the words either. So I love to take it home, give it to dad, and say, read this to me, right? And I know it's right there because my best friend had it for a week, which he wasn't supposed to have, by the way. He's only supposed to have it for three days, but he kept it for a week. So for two days, I've been waiting for that book, okay? And what am I told? Sit down. So what do I have to do? I got to figure out how to keep myself sitting here when what do I want to do? Jump over that table and get to that book, right? So what do I do? I need a pencil because why? It allows me to stay in my chair for just a right amount of time before I can run over there, which by the way, I know I'm going to get yelled at for running, but I still get the book, okay? So, but I have to do something to keep me here because I want to be there. So I chew up the pencil, okay? All right, and then number five, communicate. Sound like, feel like, looks like what? Well, not this, that's not communication. Science. That's science, silent. What? Talking, any behavior, body language, Whining. <laughs> now, are we talking high school or elementary? Doesn't matter. You got that right. Told you there's not that much difference sometimes. 16-year-old girls can whine. So can 16-year-old boys. I knew somebody was going to help me fix my behavior. About, about any of those things, okay? Communication. Here's what I want to tell you about communication, though. Through my six years of being a special ed coordinator, going around 12 different buildings, watching students, listening to parents, watching teachers, I have certainly learned that not only is it about communication, but for some of our students, it's actually this, it's the lack of the ability to communicate, okay? My behavior might exist because I don't know how to communicate or I physically cannot communicate, okay? So therefore, if you walk by me and I smack you, what am I doing? I'm communicating in the only way I know how, okay? So when you look at number five, I want you to think both ways. I want you to think about communication, and then I want you to think about the fact that it may be a lack of the ability or skill of communicating, okay? So here's what I need from you real quick. On your table, hopefully, there's still some blank note cards, right? And if I counted correctly or even got lucky here, you ought to have at least how many left? Oh, come on, somebody follow along. Five, excellent. See, there's five things up there. Here's what we need then. What we need is for you to take one note card, doesn't matter who, somebody grab one, pick a number, and write that word on there for us, okay? So I just need those five titles on a note card. Anybody need more note cards? I want you to kind of clean out the middle of your table there, and I want you to put those five cards out in the middle of the table, spread them out so you can see all five of them, in other words, we're going to kind of make columns here or groups. If you don't have enough room for columns, that's fine. Make groups. And here's what you're going to do. Remember those sticky tabs? And remember those behaviors I asked you to write down? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at that behavior. I want you to read that behavior out loud to your table group. And as a group, I want you to figure out what was the purpose of that behavior and stick it underneath there. So in other words, let's say whining is what I wrote down. So I have whining over here on my note card and I say, oh, whining is a way of communicating. So I stick it right there, okay? So at least let everybody in your table at least read their at least one out loud for the whole table so that you all get to participate in at least getting one thing. If I give you enough time, just keep going until you run out of behaviors, okay? But I got somebody back there who says, that's never happened. You're not going to run out of behaviors. I heard some discussions going on. Somebody want to share one of the discussions? What are we discussing here? It seemed like a pretty simple activity. I gave you five titles. You had a behavior. You picked one behavior that fit with one title, and you stuck it on there. 
I'm not sure that was that difficult, so tell me about the discussions. Yes? What? What? Okay, hold on. Hold on. Let me go through this one more time. See, that's, that's called bad teaching. See, I also had to give you that. Good examples. Okay, I don't think I made myself clear. There are five purposes for your behavior. You took a behavior and you put it under one purpose. That doesn't really seem that difficult. It seems pretty clear. What do you mean it could go somewhere else? What? They don't have a single cause. Well, give me a behavior that you were talking about. Slurs. Racist slurs. Okay. So if you're talking about racist slurs, is that to gain attention? It could be. Okay, great. So we're done. What? Well, hold on. All right. Number two, avoid an escape. Can I avoid an escape by using racial slurs? What? I get kicked out of class? Why would I want to get kicked out of class? Because I want to avoid and escape what I don't like. There you go. All right, number three, gain power control. Yeah. Self-stimulant? Might be. If that's how I grew up, it really is who I am. It is what I think it might be. That's the way I have to be. It might be. Number five, communicate. Are we trying to communicate something if I'm using that? Absolutely. Thank you for playing along. I did not mean to drive you crazy. Uh, or use you as an example, but I appreciate you playing along. You're absolutely right. Here's one of the biggest problems with behaviors. We all understand, or we're getting to understand, that they exist for a purpose. Here's the problem with that. The same behavior by the same student can be used for multiple purposes, not even on different days, but on the same day. Let's go through it. Let's just use slurs again. Let's talk about the first reason or purpose for using a slur. Do I gain people's attention and whose attention am I looking for? Peers or maybe the teacher. Depends on who I said it to. Okay, peers. So did I achieve that? Okay, so then I'm done. I don't need the behavior anymore. No, because what do I want to do next? I want to get out of class. So what do I do? I say it again because the teacher has said what? Don't say it again. What do I know? I got to say it again. Right. And how often do I have to say it? As many times as it takes to do what? To find what I call the goat. Okay? We all have them. We keep them tied up. Okay? What are students looking for? Your goat. Let me give you the best tip I can give you. I heard this from a wonderful person that I work with. I have used it ever since. Okay? And that is never let students know where you keep your goat. Okay? Because let me tell you what I deal with about 75% of my job is talking to teachers about what? Why students found their goat. Not only did they find them, some of them have become best friends with the teacher's goat. Some of them are feeding the goat on the side. So they don't even have to look for the goat. The goat comes to them. Okay? And what happens when they know where your goat is tied? Number one, two, and three are done. I've done everything I need to do. I got your attention. I'm going to be able to avoid and escape whatever it is you're trying to teach me. And now... Who has the goat? I do. So what do I have? The power and control. Because I've got your goat. Four, we talked about it. It could be, depending on what we're dealing with here. Okay? And certainly communicate. Okay? So here's the problem. They're here. I've given you the purpose. But the problem is you've got to take time to figure it out. And that's hard to do as a sub-teacher. I get that because you're not there every day. Okay? But at least you've got these things in your head now. Okay? At least you're thinking in that regards. Why would he be using this purpose? And why do I want you to know that? Why is it important to know that they exist for a reason? What? To solve the issue, to counteract that behavior by what? It's not about me. That's the first thing you learn. It may not be about me or my goat, or it might be. How do I solve the problem? 
just because I know the purpose. Then I can use the appropriate strategy, intervention to apply. Because the problem is, if let's say that I'm using slurs to avoid an escape, and as the substitute teacher, you say, don't say that again or I'll kick you out of class. And what do they do? Say it again. And what do you do? Sure, because you've got to follow through. You know that. OK, so I'm going to follow through. Did I get what I wanted? Yeah. Am I going to change that behavior? No, because let me tell you something else about behaviors. If they work, we don't change them. So if I'm on Kellogg and I'm driving 80 and it gets me home quicker, what am I going to do tomorrow? Drive 80, because it gets me home. It gets me what I need. So if I need to be out of your class and I know where your goat is, what happens? I get it by using a behavior that you don't like. What are we trying to do as adults and as teachers? Save the goat. Keep them in class. Teach them what? How to use a different behavior to get the same thing. Because I can tell you this, dealing with North High for one year, I can tell you this. Just one year I learned this, so I'm not as slow as I thought, but I did learn this. Okay, At North High, Students at North High, freshman through senior, doesn't matter. Girl, boy, doesn't matter. Background, didn't matter. Low income, high income, didn't matter. What's the one thing that every high school, and I'll say middle school is worse, but I did learn it at North High, but middle school is even worse. What's the one thing I don't want my peers to know about me? What I'm afraid of which ties with being different or the fact that I don't get it. So you're teaching science, and I don't get it. So what do I do? Whatever it takes to get out of there. Because what I don't want is my peers to understand that I'm the dumb one. Or at least that's how they see it. Because according to middle school kids, they're the only ones that didn't get it class of 30, and I'm the only one who doesn't get it. Look around. There are 28 other people who didn't get it. But kids don't see it that way. They know everybody's staring at them. And what's the one thing I will not let my peers know about me is I might not get it. What's OK for them to know about me? That I can get control. That I'm a bully. That I'm a class clown. That I'm a whatever. That's OK. Don't have a problem with that. I can live with that. I can go to the neighborhood and have people say that, hey, do you know that guy over there? He, man, he's the class bully. You don't want to mess with him. That doesn't bother me. But I go home to my neighborhood, and the kids are all talking about that I'm the one who don't get it. That's a problem. OK? So if I can use my behavior, and guess what? By high school, I've had lots of practice using that behavior. And it works. So for you to say, quit doing it, guess what? Doesn't work. Because I'm not going to quit because it works for me. So what we have to do is teach a different way. How do I get what I want without doing it that way? OK? Yes? I'm going to give them those choices. Okay, this blank piece of paper that I said you now have to write a research paper on. Okay, I want to avoid and escape that because I'm not good at writing research papers. Okay, I'm going to give them a choice then. You don't have to do that. You can do this. And my other choice is guess what? Writing a research paper. I'm just going to make it look different. Okay, but I'm still going to get what I want, but I got to give them a way to avoid and escape what they feel everybody's looking at them at. Okay. So maybe it's even a short break. Maybe I let them avoid an escape by going and getting a drink of water so they don't have to cuss me out. Because then I can meet them out in the hallway and say, hey, I understand you might be feeling a little frustrated here, and we don't do it in front of everybody. Okay? 
So what is causing you the problem? Is it that you don't know where to start? Is it that you weren't paying attention, don't have the directions? What is it? And then I can have that conversation, bring them back in. Now they're ready to go because we fixed the problem. So which is better, having to get a drink or using a racial slur? Okay. All right. I know this. I don't know about you because you're sitting and I'm standing. But I know this. I'm tired of talking. So I imagine you're tired of sitting. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that clock back there and we're going to take a 10-minute break. So at 20 after, we're going to start back up. Well, if I look at the clock, it's time. And we're going to get started because I don't want to have to keep you here extra because then I will have behaviors that I don't want to have to mess with. So we'll stay on time, get you out on time. So let's quickly just recap very quickly. Um, understanding the purpose of behaviors, again, there are going to be times where you don't have time as a substitute teacher to delve into that whole thing of really what's going on. But the conversation, I think, is important just so that you understand about how you react to certain behaviors. Are you feeding into actually what they want? And if you are, you're never going to win. Okay. And if it's a behavior I've been using for a long time, you're not going to change it overnight either, okay? Especially if it's something I'm very successful at. And we have a lot of kids by kindergarten age who have become very successful in using some of their behaviors to get what they want, okay? Um, if you've ever been to Walmart, okay? There's a prime example of power and control. Go to Walmart, go to the toy section. If you're not sure what it looks like when somebody wants power and control, go to Walmart, go to the toy section, check it out for about five minutes, you'll understand what I've been talking about. This is how I get what I want. This is the power and control. Okay? And after the 75th time of mom saying you can't have it, and you meet mom at the checkout and it's in the basket, you'll understand why that student does not want to give up that behavior that gets them what they want. Okay, so by you saying you can't do that or you need to stop, may not cut it. Okay, hopefully I gave you enough time to at least have the conversation at your table about those things like what is the behavior for and then certainly having the discussion that that table back there certainly got into and I think other tables got into as well and that is the fact that behavior is one of the tough things about them is I can use it for multiple purposes. Okay, and it depends on who I'm with. A uh, very quick example, and I'm going to do it quickly. Had a fifth grade student, okay, who was certainly looking for attention. Okay, how do I get the attention as a fifth grade student? Well, the first thing I do is I don't complete my math work during math time. Okay, how does that get me attention? Well, guess what? My teacher says if we don't have it done during math time, what do we get to do? We get to spend recess with my teacher doing it. Okay, whose attention am I looking for? The teacher, guess why? Because I'm a fifth grade boy, and she's a fifth grade teacher who happens to be a lady. Okay? So this doesn't seem so bad to him. I mean, I don't get my work done. I get to spend more time with her, and guess what? Most of the time, I'm the only one in there. So I don't have to share with the rest of you. Okay? But here's how it worked. I still need more attention than that. Okay, so I didn't get my work done at math time. I didn't get it done during recess. What happens next? Oh, no, well, that's a good idea, but we jumped before that. We had another step because, you know, we're good in education. There you go. We send you to the office. And guess what we find out the first time we go to the office? Who's in the office? Female secretary. Female administrator. Guess what? As a special ed coordinator, I can walk into offices and do what? Or get what? No, I get ignored. They could care less if I'm there or not. Okay? So I could stand there and nobody even pays attention that I'm there. Okay? Now, maybe if I was John Allison, that wouldn't happen. Okay? They might stop for him, but who do they stop for? A fifth grade student who didn't get his work done. Secretary no longer answers the phone because she's talking to you about why don't you get your work done, why are you in here, da 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 da. Go sit in the principal's office. Guess what happens when you get to the principal's office? Again, as a coordinator, I can walk into the principal's office and what happens? What do I get? Nothing. 
she's on the phone, she's on her computer, she's doing whatever, okay? Fifth grade student doesn't have his math work, what happens? That phone can ring all day and she doesn't answer it, okay? Because we're going to take care of this problem, okay? How many people are in there? One student, two adults. See why I don't need to change my behavior? Okay, what happens when I don't get it done in the principal's office? Could be after school, but guess what? I got to ride the bus. There you go. Who are we going to call? Ghostbusters. Yeah. And who's the ghostbuster in this house? Mom. Guess what happens when I get home after the principal's called and said I don't have my math homework done or my math work done that now became homework? Ladies, do any of you have anything to do after you've worked all day? Are you just okay to sit around and do nothing, right? I'm assuming that's how it works. I didn't say that out loud, did I? Okay. So, but what happens in this case? Is mom worried about supper, laundry, da 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 No, what is she doing? Well, we're going to talk about this homework and why you didn't get it done. How long are we going to spend? Hours. Oh, hours. Because I'll have 400 reasons why it couldn't happen. And you're going to hear all of them. Why? I want your attention. So whose problem is this? Yeah, it's certainly not the fifth grade student. He's got to figure it out. I mean, I get to spend time with my teacher. I get to spend time in the office. I get to go home and mom stops everything. What happens if I behave and I get my homework done or I get my math work done? I don't get to spend time with the teacher. I don't get to go to the office and mom's cooking and cleaning. So when I got to come in, the good news is when you're not living in the forest, it's much easier to see the trees, okay? So I got to sit down and say, hey, show me your data. Let's talk about this. Guess what we figured out as a team? Why is he not getting his math work done? Because he wants attention. What do we give him when he doesn't get it done? Attention. What do we give him when he does what we want him to do? Nothing. Why change if you're a fifth grade boy? I mean, I know, ladies, we're a little slow, us guys, but even a fifth grade guy can figure that out. I don't need to change. I got what I need, right? So what do we have to do? Yeah, we had to go the other way. You don't get it done, you get nothing. When you get it done, we'll start giving you back what you want. So it's not to get it done, you don't get it. You don't get to stay in at recess. You only get to stay in recess on Friday if Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday's math is done. Then you get to stay with the teacher. You don't get to go to the office unless the last 10 days math has been done and you didn't have to take it home to do it. Guess what mom does at home? This was a little tougher because I also knew mom, so I knew it'd be a little tougher. Is she set up a procedure when you come in, you hang up your backpack, you put these things here, you set it on the kitchen table, done or not done. Mom does what she needs to do. Mom sets a timer, we talk about it, regardless if it's done or not done for this amount of time. And then mom gives you an extra if it's done. But I don't get two hours of mom's attention because it's not done in two minutes when she says great and goes on about her business when it is done. Okay? That takes a lot of time and effort, but that's just showing you why we've got to know this because I can give you all the strategies and all the interventions to fix behaviors, but if it doesn't solve my purpose, I'm not going to go to that behavior. Okay? All right, here we go. You have a note card that on one side has the definition or the answer to the question, what is behavior, right? Find that note card, flip it over, look at this. Anybody tell me what we're going to do next? All right, see, here's another great teaching tip. Bring down the anxiety of students by keeping things routine, okay? Because then I don't have to worry about what we're going to do. Hey, I've already done this. It's okay. I know I can do this. So here we go. You even get a choice. What's your choice? Answer the question or... Write a definition. All right, here we go. Going to do it quickly. You got one minute. What we're going to do next is that round robin, right? You're going to read out loud what your definition or the answer to discipline is, okay? Everybody else is going to do what? Listen. All right, here we go. Go ahead and get started.
Here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to make you decide as a table to flip over your consensus mat and to write it on there. What we're simply going to do is we're going to talk about, since you've all heard everybody else's, I'm going to give you mine and we'll see if we're close, okay? Discipline. What is it? Well, here's my definition of discipline. It's the actions parents or teachers take to increase student success. If that is not what you're doing when you discipline somebody, you are done. Why? Because I could be looking for a positive, not a negative. It's all about student learning. Just like academics, behavior is the same thing. Students have to learn. To learn, we have to teach. What are we teaching? How to be successful, okay? Here's the other thing that I can tell you from behavior specialists that I've gone to, listened to, uh, studied under, and that is the things that you give the most attention to, the things that you pay attention to, the things that you focus on as an adult are the things that are going to happen at, from your students. So if you want to talk to me about why I can't talk when you say to stop talking, what's going to happen in the whole 45-minute class? I'm going to talk because that's what I've got you focused on. So if you want me to learn a different way, then you've got to teach me how to become successful in a different manner. Okay? And what is it that we want discipline to do? We want to change the behavior, right? Well, here's the problem. If the only thing you're thinking about discipline is as a punishment, here's the problem with that. Just like on Kellogg, I'm speeding, I get a ticket. Does it change my behavior? Maybe. What does it do for sure? Stop the behavior. For how long? Until he leaves. OK, or at least until my wife quits yelling that I had to spend $200 on a ticket, right? But the minute she quits reminding me that that happened, which will take a while, by the way, OK? But when she does quit reminding me that I just spent $200 we didn't have on a ticket I shouldn't have gotten, what will I start doing? Going back to the behavior that works for me. Speeding. There you go, all right? So if you're trying to think of discipline as punishment, the problem is the only thing you're going to do is stop the behavior, OK? And that's OK if you need the behavior to stop. There are some behaviors that have to stop. But if we're truly trying to change the behavior, you're not going to change it through discipline in a negative way, in a punishment way. Because the other thing that I can tell you about that, and I certainly have learned this being a principal at two different types of satellite schools, and that is if you're a student in the Wichita Children's Home or you're a student at Riverside Academy, there is probably nothing I can think of as a principal or as a teacher to punish you in a negative fashion that hasn't happened to you already or worse, right? I mean, I'm talking about young people who are in a lockdown facility. What is it I'm going to do that makes you gives you such a punishment that you'll actually stop the behavior. That could be worse than not being in D.C. and having to be in Kansas when it wasn't your choice to be here or your choice to not be able to go wherever you want to go or your choice to live at a home with other students and not with your family because your family dropped you off there one night. I mean, really? What do you want me to use as punishment? About 12 of the students who are at Wichita Children's Home came from the streets. In other words, they were homeless, living on the street. What as a teacher are you going to do that's worse to them than that? So if you're going to come up with a discipline and you think it's going to work because it's a huge punishment, like they're going to miss recess, <laughs> sorry. But really, missing recess, for how long? Forever. Well, first of all, they know that's a lie. Why? Because you don't want them. They're driving you nuts. Why would you keep them in recess forever? And besides that, we live in Kansas, not Washington. Okay. So how many days do we get to go outside for recess? 
you know, about five all year because it's either raining, snowing, sleeting, windy, tornado, whatever, a building exploded next to the school and there's toxic fumes. I mean, we only get about five good days to go outside anyway, right? And you're going to take those? I don't think so. Because trust me, about January, what do you think I'm doing with the schools? Teachers who are saying, well, we got to get outside. The kids have to go outside. They're driving me crazy. We can't get them outside. Okay? So kids get that. Okay? My own kids get that. You know, when I say to my daughter, you're not going to date till you're 40, she knows I can't do that. Okay? Sounds good. Made me feel better when I said it. But come on, it's not going to happen. I can't enforce that. Okay? So what we've got to do is we've got to give you a behavior that gives you the same purpose or the same outcome for what you were using that we didn't like. Otherwise, why change? Okay? All right. From there then, let's talk about, oh, there you go. Let's go back to this. Really? Who's being disciplined here? Looks to me like she's having a good time. I don't think that's too much discipline. Okay? And here's what we're talking about discipline. We want to teach kids how to do it correctly. Okay? That's what discipline's all about. It's increasing the likelihood that they're going to be successful inside of school and outside of school. All right, discipline. When you talk about discipline, there are, essentially there's three types. You're going to talk about preventive. Here's what I want to talk about with preventive discipline. Elementary folks, champs. I don't know if we've talked about that yet here. Okay, good. I'm hearing seeing heads shake from you and them. That's good. Okay. If you see this around the classroom, what do you want to know? You want to know what they're using. Pay attention to it. This is their preventive discipline. These are all the things they're teaching students on how to do it the right way. Okay? So it's out there. Look for it. Secondary folks, it's called achieve. Okay? If you see achieve in a classroom, on a poster, in the lesson plans, it talks about achieve. Why do you want to know that? That's the preventive. That's the stuff you don't have time to do as a substitute teacher. Okay? You can't come in and do the preventive. It should already be there. And I will tell you this. You don't even have to tell me. It won't be there in some classes, and you'll want to talk to me about it afterwards. I got that. We're not quite there. We're getting better. But no, we don't have 100% buy-in yet. Okay? From preventive, then we want to talk about supportive. What is supportive? Supportive discipline. What is it? Yeah, it's reinforcing that good behavior, positive reinforcement. It's that little encouragement that we all need. It's that little encouragement that says, yeah, I really want you to raise your hand before you yelled out, and I know yesterday you yelled out without even raising your hand, and today you at least raised your hand, but as soon as you raised your hand, you yelled out, and I hadn't called on you yet. Okay? But we're reinforcing the fact you're getting closer. Because we could do it the other way. We could keep yelling about the fact that you didn't wait for me to call on you. And how often do you think he's going to raise his hand? Because he got closer, and what would you do? Shot him right back down. So why do I need to get closer? I didn't get anything out of it anyway, so I'll just keep screaming without raising my hand. At least if I raise my hand and screamed out, I'm closer. Help me get there. That's that supportive. And then corrective, and that's the type of discipline that now something's happened that we didn't want to happen, so we have to correct it. Okay? All right, let's talk about that preventive discipline. This refers to the strategies that teachers use to prevent student misbehaviors. These are the things we put in place so that you don't misbehave. This is what the district is talking to teachers about every day in the fact that we have to quit assuming that every high school student knows how to behave. And I'll argue with you as long as you want me to afterwards. Because it's true. We have high school students who do not know that it is incorrect to do certain behaviors. And we can talk about why, and that I won't argue with you. There's lots of reasons why it happened and is happening. But what I can tell you is, if we want to just focus on that, we're never going to fix it. So we've got to understand that there are students out here who when you say, I want you to be good, have no clue what you just said. Because being good might mean the fact that I don't get arrested tonight. That's good enough. Right? So we can't say that anymore. 
We have to assume students don't know what it is we want them to do, so we got to teach it up front. Champs and Achieve do that. It talks about the activity you're doing, here's the expectations in every area, here's what we exactly mean. Voice level zero means you don't talk. And we've taught that. And guess what? In January, we're going to teach it again. Why? Because you went on Christmas break and forgot. Why do you think the police show up on Kellogg every once in a while? Because people forgot that they paid a $200 ticket, so I'm going to remind them. Okay, so we go back out there, all right? So what does that look like then, preventive discipline? Well, it's the rules. And again, I understand those are things you can't put in place, your substitute teachers. What you want to look for, though, are they in place? And if they are, follow them. Why? They're there for a reason. Okay? So if the rule is that the classroom you're subbing in has a seating chart, what should you follow? The seating chart. I don't care how many times he tells you it's okay to sit next to his best buddy. It is not, or the teacher in that classroom would not have a seating chart. She has it there for a reason. Okay? So those rules, classroom rules, hallway rules, school rules. If they're not in the substitute handbook, start asking for them. You need to know them. Routines, again, hard for you to establish a routine if the teacher doesn't have one. And by routines, I'm talking about simple things that happen every day, like sharpening a pencil. What's the routine for that? Because if we don't have a routine built in, what happens? I use the pencil sharpener as a behavior, either to avoid an escape, gain power and control, or to communicate to you, I don't care what you're saying, I'm going to go sharpen my pencil. Okay? So what are the procedures, and what are the routines? And if there are routines in your sub handbook, what should you do? Follow them and have the students follow them and do not let them convince you that they do not exist and they don't have to follow them. Arrangements. That's that seating chart again. Or that's the way the classroom is set up. Okay? And again, you don't have a lot of control of this. What I wanted you to be familiar with, though, is that they should exist and go find them. Now let's go to supportive discipline. It's when teachers help students gain back their self-control or when they lead students back in the right direction if they begin to show signs of that misbehavior. So it's called catch it early. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about that nonverbal communication. And you all have this, trust me. Or if you don't, you better get it before you go into that first classroom. What do you need to have? That teacher look. Yeah. You can communicate from a long ways away. You don't have to say a word. Just look. They know. <laughs> They'll change that behavior. Absolutely. So nonverbal, that's something you do have as a substitute teacher. It's that nonverbal, okay? Another nonverbal, if class starts at 945, what time do you start class? 945. You start at 9.47, what are you telling them? It's okay to be late or I'm not in control, you are. Why do you think I started on time? Because I'm in control. And it tells you that I'm prepared and I'm ready. Okay? Even if on the inside my butterflies are turning. It's those simple reminders. And again, all behavior specialists will tell you, these are the ones we need to use. These, these have the best percent percentage of actually working, okay, as quick reminders. If we can catch kids and just remind them, hey, remember what the rule is, okay, we'll have a better chance of them actually following the rule than waiting until they've broken it three times and then decide to yell at them, okay? So those quick reminders. Okay, and it can be verbal, nonverbal, can be written, okay? Can be done as a whole group, can be done as a single. Okay, you, that's the tough part about being a sub. 
Trust me, I know exactly where you all are. I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate you wanting to do it because you don't have an easy job. Teaching is not easy to start with. Being a sub-teacher is not any easier. It's even harder because you don't have the connection with students that we're hoping teachers have because that's what makes those reminders work really well if you have a connection with a kid. Okay? All right? But those reminders. Attention for responsible behavior choices. In other words, where are you going to put your focus? Put your focus on the people who are doing it right. It doesn't take a rocket science to figure out if I want your attention, then I have to do it right, because that's who she pays attention to. Also doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out if I do it wrong and I get her attention, why do I need to do it right? Okay? So focus on the responsible behavior choices. And then build positive teacher-student relationship. Build student-student relationship, which is tougher, again, as a substitute teacher. But what I'm saying is I've been into a lot of classrooms where the student-teacher relationship is good. In other words, it's a very positive, nurturing environment. Kids feel safe. But where it falls apart is the teacher allows students to treat each other crappy. You can't do that either, OK? You can't let students bully other students. You can't let students treat other students. You're the one in control. You're the one with the discipline, not them. And I've been in a lot of classes where that's all it's about is every other student discipline and every other student. Nothing gets done. OK? We don't want that. And then that encouragement. Come on. There's old sayings about that. And it really does work. So it's that encouragement. I mean, come on. If I go to work every day in my cube, no, there's no resentment about my cube. In my little cube, if I go there every day, and every day my boss comes by and tells me the things that I do wrong and never says anything about the things I do well, what happens about, oh, November 1st? My attitude gets bad. I'm out of there. I take what's called a sick day, mental health day. Why? Because I already know, just like students, probably the things I did wrong, right? I mean, OK, if you spill your coffee in the morning, is it helpful for the five people around you to say, hey, idiot, you just spilled your coffee? I mean, do you really not realize that you spilled your coffee when you spill it? Or do you find it maybe a little better when the five people around you get up and hand you napkins or start helping you clean it up? Don't you think students feel the same way? OK. Then let's talk about effective praise. We've got to praise students when they're doing it right. You've got to catch them being good. And for some of our kids, I will guarantee you, that's a job in itself. Because for some of our students, that window is small. Okay? It may be once a day, and it may only last for 15 seconds. It's kind of like when parents say, my kids are really good when they're asleep. Right? Some of our students are like that. They're really good when they walk in. And from there, maybe it goes the other way, right? Okay? So you've got to find it. But then it's got to be effective because here's what kids are telling us when we research and we talk to kids, is you can praise me all you want but it does no good if you don't do it correctly. And that's that generic praise. Hey, nice job. Yeah, and he just keeps nodding his head. Yeah, it's got to be effective because what is a nice job? Well, he's sitting there trying to figure, okay, now I'm teaching science, right? And I said, hey, nice job. And I start teaching science again. What's he doing the next five minutes? Yeah, he's trying to figure out what he did right because... He wants to do it again so that he gets more praise. But is it because he was sitting there being quiet? Is it because he has his pen in his hand? Is it because he has the right paper in front of him? So for five minutes, he's heard nothing about science, but he's trying to figure out, how do I get her to do that again? How do I get him to do that again? Okay, so it's got to be effective praise. Okay, because again, some students also come to us with what? Little or no praise ever given to them. So some of our students don't even know how to respond to it. I mean, it's, it's seriously like a whole new world. What do you mean I did it right? 
I really have very few people in my world telling me I'm okay and I did it right. So I may not know how to handle that. So it's got, we've got to do effective praise. Corrective discipline. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because if you've gotten to this point, you missed most of my presentation. Because most of my presentation and what I'm telling you is don't get here. I also teach what's called NCI, CPI. It's uh, what we use um, for a lot of things, but at the very end of it, one of the things that we use is um, physical, when we have to get physical with a student and we have to restrain them, okay? But the actual NCI training is a two-day training. We spend about a half day talking about the physical restraint. Why? Because you don't want to get there. We want to teach you a whole lot of things so you don't ever have to do that, okay? And if you've ever had to do it, you'll know why I'm talking about that. Same thing here. I hope what I gave you keeps you from ever having to get here. But sometimes, let's be honest, you have to do this, okay? It involves the implementation of consequences for students that have misbehaved or broken the rules of the classroom discipline policy, okay? So now they've done something, reminders didn't work, whatever, and now we have to be corrective. But again, we're going to start with the least amount of corrective discipline. We're going to start with simply redirecting you, okay? We're going to try to get you back to where we wanted you to be, okay? Might be just a quick redirection. Go get a drink of water, come back, okay? Two minutes of talking about something they want to talk about, then we go back to doing what they don't want to do, okay? It's that quick redirecting, okay? It can also be even a, a quick, um, what I would call kind of a surprise element in there, you know? Uh, if it's Bill over here who's misbehaving and you walk over and you say, hey, Sally, okay, redirect. What is that? What's he thinking now? Okay, one, his teacher's lost it. That's okay. He can think that for a minute because what's he not thinking about? Yeah, all the things he was trying to do to get your goat. So now he's forgot about the goat and he's going, Sally, what's he actually talking about? Okay, so now I've got his brain redirecting itself. Now I can go back and say, hey, remember, you're supposed to be doing that right there. Okay, and now he's back, okay? Then it's that verbal, it's that communication, and I will tell you about this, certainly about verbal. When you are being, as a student or as an adult, being corrected, how would you like it done? That's how your students would like it done. In other words, Jill, knock it off. No, I mean now. You need to stop. Look, everybody, look at her. Isn't that ridiculous? Tell her to stop. How am I supposed to teach with that? Is that how you want to be corrected if you've made a mistake? Probably not how Jill wants to be corrected either. Because what does Jill want everybody else around her not to know? That she doesn't get it. What do they all now know? She doesn't get it. You just made it everybody aware of the fact Jill doesn't get it. Thanks for helping her. There you go. Written. Maybe it's just a written note. You know, maybe it's a note to the office, whatever, but it can be written. Okay? And then loss of privileges. Be careful with those because again, you're making a judgment call. It's like a behavior that's good or bad. Loss of privilege, you can't go outside. Well, guess what? For some of our students with the disability of emotional disturbance, you know what? That's fine. Thank you very much. You made my day. Because where do I not figure it out? On the playground. I don't get this whole social thing. What do you mean I can't run up to you, take the ball, and start playing basketball? I don't get that that's a problem. So you know what? If I don't have to go out there, great. My day just got better. Okay? Because I don't even understand all that. And every day, guess what happens to me when you make me go out there? Somehow I get in trouble. And it doesn't seem to matter what I do. If I take the ball, I get in trouble. If I don't take the ball, I get in trouble because I find something else to do, like knock somebody off the teeter-totter. Well, I don't know what the problem with that is. I want it on the teeter-totter. They were on it. I knocked them off. Now I'm on it. What's the problem? I mean, that's how it works in the neighborhood. That's how it works at home. Why can't it work here? So 
You know, if you take recess away, great, I'm happy. Okay? So be careful with those loss of privileges. All right? And then classroom management. Really, the only thing I want to talk about there is really basically what we're talking about is the things that we've talked about. It's the instruction of now not only looking at, as a district, the academic side, but we certainly have the data to prove that we have to look at the social behavior as well. And certainly, I can tell you this, as I go into my schools and I talk to teachers, and one of the slides I put up for them is, I will put up a slide and it says something about, if the student can't, and I'll put up the first example and it'll be read. And I'll say, what are we going to do? And I get 100 great ideas of what we can do. We can provide them extra support. We can tutor them after school. We can do SIPs. That's an elementary program for reading and decoding. We can do this. You know what? I'll give up part of my lunchtime and I'll help that person understand vowels because they just don't get those vowels. So you know what? I'll give up part of my lunch. It's OK. All right? And then I'll put up the second one, and it'll say, um, understand long division. Student can't understand long division or doesn't understand long division. I'll say, what are we going to do about it? I'll get 40 different great ideas of what we're going to do. All of a sudden, I've got a whole team over here. I've got the sixth grade team, and they're all thinking about ways they're going to help this student figure out how to do long division. Okay? And I'll keep going. I'll put up five or six of those, all into the academic range, right? So what's my last one? Behavior. Student can't behave. That's all I put, behave. What are we going to do about it? What's the conversation look like? Silence or punishment. You betcha, man. We are going to find everything we can think under the sun to make your life miserable. That's how we're going to fix it. But if you can't read, we're willing to do whatever. But if you can't behave, not my problem. We got to stop that. Because we, we truly have students who don't know how to behave. And I won't argue with you about the reasons or if it's our job or not. What I'm telling you, though, it's our job because if you don't fix that, there is no education. So what do we got to do? Well, we got to teach those important rules. We got to develop those routines. We got to look at our physical arrangements. I mean, how many times have you walked in, and you don't have to say this out loud because I already know but just think about this. How many rooms have you walked in, you look at the teacher's desk back there in the corner, and you have no idea what happened? It's like a disaster zone, right? I mean, you're wondering where in the world is the student, or is the sub handbook, right? Because she said it was on her desk, and you're going, well, for the first 30 minutes, I'm not even sure there's a desk there. But maybe, but you don't dare want to walk over there, because if you touch something, what's going to happen? 48 things are going to fall. But yet, I will guarantee you we walk into that teacher's classroom tomorrow and what's the first thing she's yelling about? Why does your desk look like that, Jill? Clean that up. No wonder you can't find your homework. My goodness gracious. Well, you got rats living in there? I mean, seriously. We got to think about our physical arrangements. Again, it's about, it's about showing students, teaching them. So if you're going to yell about them not being able to find stuff in their desk, maybe your desk shouldn't look like that, huh? OK? And then we're going to do that to maximize the probability that students will be successful, because that's what it amounts to. If you're not trying to help them be successful, you will not win. Because I will guarantee you I don't care if it's a pre-K, which I have in some of my buildings. So we're talking about cute little three and four-year-olds, OK? Or my high school that I used to have, or the high school that I'm the principal at now, doesn't matter which one, but if we're not trying to help them be successful, we are going to lose. We have to try to make them successful, whatever it is we want them to do. Okay? And it's our job because it's not happening anywhere else for some students. Okay? So from there, just real quick, we're going to wrap it up. Characteristics of an effective classroom are these things right here. You have a high success rate of students behaving, low incident of behavior problems. In other words, the teacher doesn't spend 40 minutes of the 45 minutes trying to get people to behave. They actually are behaved and they actually teach and kids learn. And you have high academic learning time and engagement time. There's your biggest bang for your buck. 
You want to write something down? You want to start? You want to take something home with you? There it is. You can ignore everything else I said if you feel like it, but don't ignore that one. If you want your classrooms to run better, get kids engaged. Because guess what? If I'm engaged, what am I not thinking about? <laughs> All those behaviors that work for me. Because I don't need them. Because I'm engaged. Things are going well. Okay? When students aren't engaged, what are they thinking about? Yeah, where's that goat? I'm thinking about that goat. Where is he at? I'm going to find him by the end of the hour, right? Okay, so we want to have students engaged, then they don't have time to think about it. Okay, your other two pages that aren't part of the handout, and don't worry about if we didn't hit all the slides, it's okay. Your other two pages are simply reminders. They're just good things for you to take with you. Talks about discipline, talks about classroom management, do's and don'ts. Um, real quick, thank you. Couple of quick things that I'll say about do's and don'ts because I said I'd quit talking. Uh, do's and don'ts. Do not touch students. Okay, unless you don't like working for the district. If you don't want to work for the district, that's fine. Touch kids. You won't work for us long. Okay. And don't leave kids unattended. Because when kids are left unattended, what do they do? Everything we would like them not to do. Okay. And who's responsible for that? You. Okay? Thank you for your time. You were a great group.